how did I make that decision? It was somewhat serendipity, and it was, it was not really strategic, but it was my instinct and my gut, and that I watched my classmates uh, graduate from Vassar. Some of them go to get master's degrees, and then they wanted to come to Washington. That was you know, a really attractive thing to do back then, <coughs> and, and it is now again. But um, they went to Washington. They all want to work on the Hill. They went up to the Hill, and they all wound up being uh, receptionists or administrative assistants. I don't mean administrative assistants in the sense of chief of staff. I mean aides. Uh, where the guys are called classmates from Yale and, and Harvard and Dartmouth and Princeton, uh, without graduate degrees, all wound up being legislative assistants. The guys got the professional jobs, and the girls, and there were boys and girls, the girls got uh, the, the um, administrative jobs, the non-professional jobs. And I thought, I'm not gonna, that's not going to happen to me. And I figured the only, one of the ways you can be sure that doesn't happen is if you get a law degree. If you get a law degree, you get your ticket stamped, and they cannot treat you as a non-professional. They just can't, uh, even if they wanted to. The fact was, you have a law degree. And that was as much it as anything. I had no interest, really, in practicing law, but I wanted, <coughs> I wanted to stamp the ticket. And I also really wanted the kind of thinking that, uh, that our legal education provides in the sense of logic and analysis and uh, writing. And uh, those were very important skills for me. Did you enjoy going through law school? Did you enjoy I it? loved law school. Yale Law School was a very laid back place. and. Uh, in contrast to Harvard, which was not, it was kind of you know the fear factor. Yale was very very laid back, and um, I'd worked very hard at Vassar, and somewhat hard at Columbia. And I really just, I, I didn't want a lot of pressure, and I didn't have that at Yale. As a matter of fact, the year after we left, Yale got rid of grades, which was <laughs> indicative of, of kind of you know the the attitude. Interesting. So tell me about some of the experiences you had while you were Yale, because one, I think you went in under a program that was very new to welcoming women. Was that not true that women uh, were new into this program? No. Uh, Yale mm -hmm. had had uh, women in the law school since the 1920s, okay. but a very, very few of them. What was different was, um, during that time, uh, Yale and Vassar were talking about going co-ed or co-education, and uh, it fell apart because Yale's, uh, Yale said, we want, we, want to, we want to be co-ed, we want to have Vassar become part of Yale, but you're going to lose your name and you're going to lose your campus. And if any of you know upstate New York, Poughkeepsie is two and a half, uh, back in those days, they weren't major highways. Poughkeepsie is two and a half hours at least, if not more, from New Haven. And so it really wasn't sensible to have two campuses, though they were going to use the, they were going to use the Vassar campus for some special things. So they asked Vassar to move to Yale, and Yale basic, uh, Vassar basically said no. So Yale decided to go co-ed itself. And when they decided to go co-ed themselves, they looked around and they said, we don't know anything about girls. <laughs> we don't know anything about women. And so they asked and they invited um, some of the graduate students, myself and I think one other person from the law school and some people from um, the different graduate programs, if we would become part of a program that assigned ourselves, or which would be assigned to the Yale colleges. The Yale system has colleges within the university. And uh, just tell the, the master of the college and the boys uh, what it's like to be a girl and what it would be like to have co-education. So I said yes, and I was assigned to Timothy Dwight, which is called TD. And I remember vividly standing with the master of the college, who was a very distinguished elderly man, in the boys' bathroom looking at the urinals and saying, those have to go. <laughs> 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 and you know, he said, you're going to need this kind of bathroom. You're going to need this kind of thing. And they all just, you know, their eyes were just bugging out of their heads. It's kind of <laughs> like, what? Um, but co-education did happen the year after I left, but we laid the groundwork for it. And I'm evidently an honorary member of Timothy Dwight. <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. So after you completed your studies in law, what did you do next? I applied and became a White House Fellow. I don't know how many people in this room know about the White House Fellows Program, but it was a program that was started by um, Lyndon Johnson and John Gardner, who at that point was Secretary of, of when they used to call it Health, and Health Education and Welfare, HEW. Um, and it was a program, John Gardner believed very strongly that, that uh, educated and civil society needed an educated leadership class. And he wanted to develop young people who had an understanding of the intersection between government and the private sector. And so he wanted um, initially young people in the late stage of their early careers. Um, but I applied anyway. And uh, we wound up, it, back then it was a very popular program. This was in its fifth year. There were about 3,000 applicants. And eventually you wound up with 18 fellows. Um, and you were assigned to 
cabinet members were the White House, and I was assigned to John Ehrlichman in the White House. This was the Nixon White House, and my husband-to-be, who I met, as a, though he says we met earlier, but I think we met at the <laughs> White House Fellows uh, <coughs> Finals weekend, um, wound up with, um, at the Labor Department with uh, George Shultz, who at that point was Secretary of Labor before he became head of OMB and then Secretary of State. But I think the, uh, well, the, the story we talked about earlier when we met was that I went, you needed to have a recommendation from your dean or wherever, wherever your employer was. I didn't have an employer. I was at law school, so it was my dean. And his name was Dean Poole. And I went to him and said, I'd like to be a White House <coughs> fellow. And he looked and they said, well, I don't take girls. I said, yes, they do. He said, show me. So I showed him the brochure. And there was Doris Kearns, who I can never hold a candle to, the famous author who'd been a fellow a uh, number of years back and a few others. And one of my, uh, not a classmate, but a, a, a friend from Vassar. And he said, well, they'll never take you. They'll absolutely never accept you. This is absolutely ridiculous. I said, well, you, will you write a letter? And he said, no. And so I went to uh, another academic dean. Who I, went, I went to one of my professors, actually. He said, I'll write the letter. And so I did become a White House fellow. But he was fairly dismissive of it. He said, they just, you know, they will not take it. And they didn't refer to you in those days as women. You were girls. And they were, in fairness, they were boys, too. But, well, they were probably um, confused because they called it a fellow. <laughs> That's probably what they, they probably just didn't Could understand. Be. They took it literally. What do you it think was you did experience. to distinguish yourself to be selected out of that large group of people who were applying? What well, was it that you think Interestingly you? enough, I was female. I really think that was a plus, not a minus. I mean, because there were not many women applying. Um, number two, for whatever reason, they decided that that year they would take people, some people right out of school. They've now changed that again, and you really now are supposed to be in the mid-stage of your career. Uh, and number three, I had a very interesting niche, and I literally talked my way through all the interview process on that niche, and that was that I knew a lot about uh, Native American education law and something about Native American land and water rights, and that happened simply because I was at Yale at the law school, and it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and the, I don't know how many of you remember the Office of Economic Opportunity, but OEO. Uh, was again started by Lyndon Johnson, and its first program, uh, legal aid program on an, on an Indian reservation, was on the Navajo reservation. Uh, and the program was called DNA, not the, which is DNA. It, it, it's a welcoming word, it's not the DNA of today. Um, and it was draft deferral. Thus, uh, a number of my classmates went out to the Navajo reservation in this legal services program because it was draft deferral, and they got involved in an Indian community control of school case and they needed people to help them and Yale sent me out for a month and a half during my senior year to um, to work on this in this project so I wound up knowing a fair amount about Indian education law how I got into Indian why they called me was because our second year uh, there were two professors a guy named Alex Bickle who who later died and John Simon and I and you had to take a seminar that led to your thesis which was what everybody had to do at Yale at the end, and I really wanted these professors, and the only thing they were teaching was education law, so I went into that. So it was all kind of serendipity. If I hadn't won those professors and gotten in that seminar, I wouldn't have wound up on the Navajo Reservation, which was helpful to writing my thesis, and I wouldn't have had something to talk about. And I guess it's, it's really applicable to anything you do in life, and that is if you somehow stand out from the pack, uh, no matter what it is, but you have something that is specifically yours that is not other people's that people are interested in, they view you in a very positive way. And now I wind up reading White House Fellows applications because each one, they're up to, again, about 3,000. Each are read by four people, so they ask former fellows to read, <coughs> to read them in the first round. <coughs> and after you sit there for seven hours and you read 85 applications, I mean, you need something that makes you stand out, something that says, oh, yeah, you do something different because everybody else is, this is quote, bright and smart and has good, you know, yeah, they wouldn't have gotten it if they had not. So <coughs> no, and so you need something you. to distinguish yourself. And so it was Indian law. I think that's fascinating. I think that's like one of those little moments we like to take and say, did you reflect about that? What do you do to distinguish yourself? You know, sometimes it's doing that one-off thing that maybe was improbable, and you wouldn't think normally to do that. But maybe that's the one thing you should do because you've gained experience. And I always tell everybody, get as much experience as many places you can, even if it seems different. I don't care what it is. You never know where you're going to call back on that. And it's your life's toolbox. You'll pull it out at some point. 